Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and to govern those whom you've set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Today's first lesson is from the book of Romans, chapter 6, 1b through 11. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 69, <clears throat> verses 8 through 11 and 18 through 20. We'll read it together. Surely for your, for your sake, sake have I suffered reproach, reproach and, shame and shame has, has covered, covered my, my face. face. I have become, become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for, for your house has eaten, eaten me up. up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but there that was turned to my reproach. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. Glory, Glory to the, the Father, Father, and to the Son, Son and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now, and will, will be, be forever. forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. 
It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, for decades now, I've kept in my office one of those page-a-day calendars that features the 365 stupidest things ever said. To my knowledge, they've never had to repeat. And some of the best ones of these come from sportscasters. And this week I got one from a man named Jeffrey Boycott, who's an English cricket player and uh, now commentator, who said... History is there to be made, but it doesn't happen very often. History is there to be made, but it doesn't happen very often. I have to say I don't think that quote belongs in my calendar. I mean, while history in the sense of things that happened is in fact happening all the time, history in the sense of things that happened that people will later recognize as important does not, in fact, happen very often. Just this week, we saw the armed forces of two nuclear-armed nations get into a skirmish. We saw COVID-19 numbers go down in Maryland and up in other states. We received decisions on a number of momentous Supreme Court cases. Our federal government saw several notable personnel changes. Statues are being pulled down across the country, and we still don't have baseball. Now, years from now, people will be able to look back on this time and tell which of these things really was important and which just seemed important. Lacking that perspective, we can only guess. And it is that lack of perspective that seems to be at the root of so many problems. And if we know what's important, then we can focus our limited energies and attention on the things that merit them. If we don't, We may be active, but extremely unproductive. Now, in our gospel lesson, Jesus tells his disciples that they lack perspective, that their fears are entirely misplaced. You're afraid of what people will do to you if you preach this message that I've given you, Jesus says. You know who you really need to be afraid of? God. Now, this word fear is often soft-pedaled. Even in our collect this morning, the original language of the prayer was changed in the 1979 prayer book so that we pray that God would make us have a perpetual love and reverence for His holy name rather than make us to have a perpetual fear and love of it, as the right one still renders Cranmer's original translation of a much older Latin prayer. 
I've noticed that every time this word fear pops up in Scripture in referring to the posture people ought to have toward God, people, often my colleagues, fall all over themselves to say, well, it doesn't really mean you're supposed to be afraid of God. No, no, no. You, it means you're supposed to have a lot of respect for Him. But the most important thing is that you love God, and it's hard to love somebody you're afraid of. The great commentator Dale Bruner wrote about this verse, the tender-minded message that the Father of Jesus Christ is not to be feared but loved is a pious fraud. Dozens of times in the Old Testament, God's people are specifically commanded to fear Him. Jesus does not tell His disciples, yeah, that's not really what they meant. No. He tells them, you're afraid of the wrong things. That fear you're giving to people you're afraid of? You may remember the old Rodgers and Hammerstein tune from The King and I, I Whistle a Happy Tune, which has the lyrics. I will recite them. I will not sing them. Whenever I feel afraid, I hold my head erect and whistle a happy tune so no one will suspect I'm afraid. And then goes on to say, the result of this deception is very strange to tell, for when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. It's a cute little ditty. Gives the female lead a chance to sing it with a bunch of cute little kids. But Jesus is not into cute. He's not telling his disciples to whistle a happy tune. He knows intimately, having been made man, that we as human beings are wired to experience fear. Fear stimulates the kinds of responses that can protect us from hazards. But just as maturity involves learning to love the right things, it also means learning to fear the right things. And it is right to fear God. We pray in the suffrages and evening prayer that we may depart this life in your faith and fear and not be condemned before the great judgment seat of Christ. We entreat you, O Lord. There, at least, the right to language keeps its spine. A distinct lack of fear of God is one of the problems Paul's addressing in our Romans passage where he says, so if God's grace is demonstrated in showing forgiveness to sinners, then I guess that means the more we sin, the more God gets to be gracious, right? By no means. And here again, most translations fail to convey the vigor of the original language. The Greek here is megenoita, which is sometimes translated as may it never be or God forbid. I prefer the way the Greek scholar Clarence Jordan rendered it in his Southern Inflected 1968 paraphrase, the cotton patch version of Paul's epistles. Hell no. Now, partly Paul's annoyed because people are claiming, falsely, that the grace-filled gospel he preaches is just a license to sin. But he's also annoyed because thinking this way means you have completely missed the point of what he's trying to say. In chapter 5 of Romans, which we talked about last week, Paul says that by virtue of Christ's atoning death on our behalf, we have peace with God who demonstrated His own love for us and that even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't require that we clean up our act first. He invited us to the party even though we weren't dressed right. He gave us spiffy new clothes, better than any we could ever afford. But none of this means that sin isn't sin. The fact that God solves our problem doesn't mean that we didn't have a problem to be solved. But if you go back to living the way you did when you had the problem, Paul says, you're losing out on the new life that Christ offers us. Again, that new life doesn't come without death. First, Christ's, and then ours, when we die with Him in baptism. Think about that imagery, by the way. Yes, there's a sense in which baptism signifies a cleansing of sin with clean, life-giving water water washing over the person being baptized. But there's another kind of water in Scripture. It's the kind we find in the unordered, watery deep of creation, the kind Jesus walks on, the kind whipped up by the storm that He stills, the kind that the writer of Revelation tells us is entirely absent from the new heavens and the new earth. 
It's the kind of water that symbolizes chaos, danger, death. And that kind of water is also involved in baptism. When the person being baptized is submerged and then brought back out of the water, at least that's what they told me in seminary we have to do, what we're signifying is death and rebirth. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, Paul says, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So if all of this is true, and it is, then it makes perfect sense for Jesus to tell us not to be afraid of anybody other than God. I mean, if we've already died, what more can anybody do to us? So my brothers and sisters, at this time when we are faced with so many scary things, I'm not going to tell you to not be afraid. I'm simply going to remind you of what Jesus said, which is that you should be afraid of God. And that fear most certainly involves reverence and awe and veneration and love and wonder and all of the positive things that come with fearing God, but, but be afraid. Be very afraid, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Continue our worship by reciting together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, and came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For us, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially Eugene, our own bishop, Bob, our assisting bishop, for Jason, our priest in charge, Ron, our supply priest, Carl, our former rector, Michael, our presiding bishop, we pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and also for Pope Francis, the patriarchs of the Orthodox churches, the leaders of the Protestant churches, and for all the holy people of God, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. 
We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, especially our President Donald, our Governor Larry, our County Executive Stewart, that they may serve and promote the dignity of freedom of every person. And that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, especially Brady, Rob, Eric, Pat, Dawn, Milton, Glenn and Kimberly, Janet, Wanda, Beverly, Alfred and Julia, Anne, Laura, Marlis, Pat, Amy, Jerry, Roger, Jay, Neil, Ernie, Lauren, Leo, Jonathan, Elizabeth, Jeff, and Dan. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. O God of compassion, giver of life and health, we pray your healing mercies upon all who are in any way affected by the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. <coughs> Comfort and sustain those who have been stricken. Relieve their pain and restore to them your gifts of gladness and strength. Grant to all in authority the courage to make wise decisions that are essential for the common good and strengthen them to lead institutions that care for those whom they serve. Watch over all first responders and those in the medical professions whose duty it is to care for the sick, guard them from all danger, and keep them safe in the knowledge that is through their sacrifice and service that the health of the whole community is promoted. <coughs> Mercifully accept these our prayers, O God, of all comfort and our help in all need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you're able. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Well, I know we have uh, one anniversary to celebrate today. Uh, Melinda and Dan are celebrating, I understand, 39 years. Congratulations. Do we have any other birthdays uh, or anniversaries? You all can have a seat, by the way. <laughs> all right. Will you, will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for Melinda and Dana and for the per perseverance you have given to both of them to uh, live out 39 years of this union you have created. And we pray that you would continue to give them joy and fruitfulness in their marriage. In Christ's name, amen. All right. um, you may have noticed we're doing many things in order to trim the time that we are all here inside together. Uh, so I'm not going to take a long time with the announcements other than to say uh, that when we celebrate the Eucharist today, what I'll invite you to do is to come forward through the center aisle, uh, keeping a six-foot distance from anybody not in your uh, household. Uh, I'll uh, uh, administer communion from here. Simply hold out your hands, and I will uh, drop the wafer into your hands. And then... Um, go back out that way so you don't trip over all the cords that Don and, and uh, uh, Mark have. Um, uh, go, go back out that way and then back, back to your seats. Um, and uh, I appreciate all of you who have been working to make this all work, especially Mark and Don. 
uh, and uh, ask for your patience as we get all of this dialed in in this new way we're doing it. But uh, please do keep your mask on uh, at all times uh, and, until you uh, to receive the bread, which probably is best to do when you get back to your seat. The blessed Apostle Paul tells us that when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Therefore, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God. and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. 
he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Amen. Is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Laura, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I am the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Birth of the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. the bread of heaven. Glory the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Kathy, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Liz, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Franny, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 
Don the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Matt the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Daniel, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Jonah, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Bill, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Charlie, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Ron, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Melinda, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. David, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Mark, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Don, will you receive? pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.